There it is, I think. Well, I, um, brother, brother Law always likes a title, and when I took homiletics, you won't believe I took homiletics, but I took homiletics at Tennessee Temple, and uh, they said the purpose of a title was to advertise, and uh, it's supposed to be catchy. Well, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give a title, and it's just a matter of fact, you know, just the facts. Uh, Christmas and Romans 8.28. Uh, now, you say, I've never heard a Christmas message preached from Romans 8.28 before. Neither have I. And maybe, maybe in that sense, um, it will serve uh, the purpose of advertising. If you would, turn there for a minute. Um, we're going to refer back to it from time to time. We're going to go a few other places. We're not going to jump around a lot. We're going to look at uh, a few different places and, and extended uh, passages in, in each place, mostly. Romans 8.28 says... And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Um, I think what got me thinking in this direction, and by the way, some of you who uh, were um, morning Bible study time before last have already heard a piece of this, but I think it bears repeating. Uh, so I, I hope you agree. Um, I think what got me thinking in this direction was Doc's situation. Level, Laval, I never have quite under, he goes by Doc, so I don't really know how to pronounce his first name. Uh, Porter, he's uh, one of the city guys, and uh, uh, for those of you who don't know, he um, was taken to the hospital a while back, uh, uh, had to have emergency surgery, and, and uh, although the surgery seems, he, he came through it successfully, he's still got a serious situation. And if you want, you go there to lift him up, and he'll lift you up. He's just got a positive spirit, and, and you can't help but love the guy. Um, it's Christmas time, and here he is, hospitalized, having required emergency surgery, and possibly having a permanent physical impairment from it. While visiting him the other day, I reminded him about how faithfully he has been praying for his sister's spiritual needs. He was so consistent, in fact, that others have continued to carry on that request in his absence. I think of uh, Rebecca and, and, and others have mentioned it. Could it be that Doc's situation is part of God's answer? Could it be? I don't know, but could it be? If she became aware of how serious his condition is, and yet what a victorious spirit he has about it, she might reconsider what he has to say. My plan this evening is to confirm the principle of our text, Romans 8.28, by looking at some scriptural examples of it, and then making an application to Christmas. We'll see clearly that our text does not say that everything that happens is good. What it does say is that God works everything together for good. For the first and probably most obvious example, we turn to Genesis chapter 30. And the birth of Jacob's, or Israel's, 11th son, his first by his wife Rachel. Genesis chapter 30. Genesis chapter 30 and verses 22 to 24 read this way, And God remembered Rachel, and God hearkened to her, and opened her womb. And she conceived and bare a son, and said, God hath taken away my reproach. And she called his name Joseph, and said, The Lord shall add to me another son. And now that you've found Genesis 30, I'm sorry, I'm ready to move on to Genesis 37, but we'll be in 37 long enough to make it worth your while to turn there. Genesis 37, we pick up the story again, verses 1 through 10. 
And Jacob dwelt in the land wherein his father was a stranger, in the land of Canaan. These are the generations of Jacob, verse 2, Joseph being 17 years old. We're following Joseph primarily, so we're going to maybe kind of hit the highlights through these verses, not necessarily reading every word. We look at verse 3, and we read, Now Israel, or, or, or Jacob, loved Joseph more than all his children, because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a coat of many colors. Probably many of you have, have, have um, either personally recognized or been brought to recognize that <clears throat> it's dangerous. It's, it, it's, it almost always leads to trouble to have a favorite son, a favorite child, whether it be son or daughter. Um, and this situation was no exception. When his brethren saw, verse 4, this situation of the favoritism that Jacob showed him, they, the Bible says, hated him. That's a strong word. That's a strong word. And um, it happens when there's favoritism. Verse 5, And Joseph dreamed a dream, and he told it to his brethren, and they hated him yet the more. Verse 7 talks about the dream. Um, uh, they were binding sheaves in the field and, and he tells his brothers your sheaves stood round about and made obeisance to my sheaf in other words they, they became subservient and verse 8 as you might expect and they hated him yet the more for his dreams verse 9 he had yet another dream and he describes it, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars made obeisance to me, representing his family. And he told it. His father rebuked him. Some would say that Joseph was proud or boastful for continuing to share his dreams. I'm not sure we can say that confidently. He was still a kid and shared some really strange dreams. I mean, if you had a dream like that, would you possibly uh, talk about it? Um, surely he sensed his brother's indignation or hatred, as the scriptures call it. He acted unwisely, to be sure, perhaps even played the fool. Paul Johnson's favorite book of the Bible, Proverbs 29, 11 says, A fool uttereth all his mind, and he certainly didn't restrain himself. But to say more than that seems to me to be no more than opinion, speculation, or even presumption. Continuing in Genesis 37, verse 13, we have a, 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 a situation developing here. Israel said to Joseph, uh, I'm going to send you to your brethren, verse, verse 13. And in verse 14, he sent him. Moving on down, Genesis 37, verse 18. When they saw him afar off, they, I mean, before he even got there, they conspired against him to slay him. And Reuben heard it and delivered him out of their hands and said, Let us not kill him, but cast him, verse 22, into this pit. Genesis 37, 24 and 25 and they took him and cast him into a pit. There was no water in it. Verse 25, a company of Ishmaelites came from Gilead with their camels. Now, let me just pause right here. Is there any way we could call Joseph's uh, brothers throwing him into the pit good? Well, except perhaps that it was better than being killed. Um, I, I guess I would probably opt for the pit if I were in that situation. But it, we can't call it good. We really can't. Verse 28, Then there passed by Midianites, merchantmen, and they drew and lifted up Joseph out of the pit and sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver, and they brought Joseph into, into Egypt. Question again. Is there any way we could call Joseph's brothers selling him to the merchants and being taken to Egypt good? In Egypt, chapter 39, verses 1 through 5, you know the story, many of you. Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, bought him. 
and the Lord was with Joseph. It probably didn't look like it uh, in those initial circumstances, but the Bible says the Lord was with him. His master, verse 3 of chapter 39, saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. Joseph found grace in his sight. And Potiphar, verse 5, made him overseer in his house. And the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. Sounded like things were looking up. But somebody was looking around. Moving on in chapter 39, verses 7 to 12, And it came to pass after these things that his master's wife, Potiphar's wife, cast her eyes upon Joseph and said, Lie with me. She was proposing openly immorality. But, verse 8, he refused. And down in verse 10, And it came to pass as she spake to Joseph day by day, in other words, she was relentless, that he hearkened not unto her, to lie by her or to be with her. That phrase, or to be with her, is a good indicator of how seriously Joseph resisted. I used to wonder why he didn't simply complain to Potiphar. Later I realized that such accusations against his wife would surely enrage him, even if he were aware of his wife's tendency to behave in this way. Verse 12, well, verses 11 and 12, And it came to pass about this time Joseph went into the house to do his business, and there was none of the men of the house there within. And she caught him by his garment, saying, Lie with me. And he left his garment in her hand and fled and got him out. Now this action was consistent with Paul's advice to Timothy in 2 Timothy 2.22, it was the right thing to do. He, he tells him there to flee youthful lusts. That's exactly what he did. But now, ladies, Mrs. Mrs. Kelly, I, I don't know if you recall or not, but several years ago, you had me bring a message uh, to the ladies group. And in that message, I made a, st a statistical case for the fact that um, a godly woman is God's ultimate creation. I mean, every step, every day, every hour of the day, the, the creation was increasing in glory and in complexity. And he got to man, and I see no indication that he changed course at that point. The next step was, was a woman. So I'm, 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 do not misunderstand me here. I say this <laughs> in, 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 with, with a view to self-preservation. Very little is as potentially dangerous as a worldly woman scorned. See what I'm saying? We're not talking about a godly woman. We're talking about a worldly woman. Verses 14 to 20. She, um, she says, uh, the, the, the Hebrew came in unto me to lie with me, and I cried with a loud voice. Bald-faced lie. Um... Uh, he left his garment with me and fled. And then she laid up the garment uh, till her husband came home and she's, she spoke to him, verse 17, and basically repeated the story. And uh, with all the added uh, details of the lie, I lifted up my voice and cried and he left his garment with me and fled out. And uh, think about it, fellas. How would you react if, 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 if your wife gave you a story like that? He was... He was angry. His wrath was kindled. And Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison, a place where the king's prisoners were bound, and he was there in the prison. Is there any way we could call this good? Genesis chapter 40. You know the story. While in the prison, Joseph interpreted the dreams of two of the king's servants one of whom was restored to the king's service, just as Joseph predicted he would be in his interpretation. Genesis 41, later when the king had a dream and wanted it interpreted, that restored servant told the king about Joseph having accurately interpreted his dream. Joseph was summoned out of the prison and interpreted the dream for Pharaoh. The interpretation had such a huge national ramification that the king put Joseph in charge of the country second only to the king himself. According to the interpretation, in seven years, a seven-year worldwide famine would begin. 
So Joseph set up a plan whereby Egypt would set aside corn to have on hand during that time. In later chapters, only in Egypt was there food during the famine, and that forced everyone to come to Egypt for it, including Joseph's brothers and finally even his father. Joseph's separation from his family had gone on for many years. He had gotten married and had children. When Joseph's brothers came, became aware of who he was, they understandably feared for their lives. Joseph had the power to do anything he might imagine to them in retaliation for the wrong they had done to him. Was Joseph's being thrown into the pit good? No. Was Joseph's uh, what was his being sold into slavery by his brothers and carried into Egypt good? No. Was his being thrown into prison for more than two years based on the lies of Potiphar's wife when he was completely innocent good? No. But God worked it together for good. Joseph recognized and expressed the principle clearly when he calmed his brother's fears in Genesis chapter 15, verses 19 to 21 with the words, And Joseph said unto them, Fear not, for am I in the place of God? But as for you, ye thought evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring to pass as it, as it is this day to save much people alive. Now, therefore, fear ye not, I will nourish you and your little ones. And he comforted them and spake kindly unto them. This is surely one of the clearest examples of the principle of Romans 8.28 in Scripture. There are others. Let's jump forward to one of them in the New Testament. John chapter 11. John chapter 11. Now the whole chapter, 45 verses, uh, convey the story I want to look at. I've, I've gotten other messages from John chapter 11. Uh, uh, and and, and it's, it's the account of, of the raising of Lazarus. But I got something else this time. Uh, we're going to kind of skip down through the highlights. We're not going to take the time to read it all. I hope that reassures you. Uh, verse 1. Now a certain man was sick named Lazarus. Uh, verse 3, therefore his sister sent unto him, meaning Jesus. Verse 4, Jesus said, this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. And how did he respond? Well, verse 6 says he abode two days still in the same place. Um... Then uh, down to verse 11. These things said he after that he saith unto them, our, our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go that I may awake him out of sleep. Then said his disciples, Lord, if he sleep, he shall do well. Howbeit Jesus spake of his death. But they thought that he had spoken of taking of rest and sleep. Then said Jesus unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And then he made this this statement that must have must have been at least curious to them he said and I am glad for your sakes that I was not there wow wow what kind of friend is that we're gonna find out to the intent here it is that you may believe nevertheless let us go unto him on the way he encountered Martha. He conversed with her a bit. Uh, and in verse 23, he said, Thy brother shall rise again. Then in a little bit, he encountered Mary and, 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 and uh, empathized with, with her weeping. Verse 35, I, every time I read this chapter, I, I just awe at, at this verse. Verse 35, everybody can memorize scripture. Jesus wept. God wept. He cares. He cares. Verse 39, he said, Take ye away the stone. And uh, Martha uh, questioned that um, in, in, a, 
in, in a way that she just um, she, she just didn't understand. She wanted clarification. She wanted to make sure not only that she understood, but that he understood. He hath been dead four days, and uh, warned that uh, a body dead that long is is, is deteriorated. It's going to smell bad. And by the way, that's going to be the case with every one of us. No matter how pretty you are, you've been in the ground for a while, you're going to smell bad. Me too. I mean, I'm not, I, 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 maybe I should point it this way first. We had a pastor out in, in, in Wyoming for a number of years, and uh, he said maybe instead of the, the, the Miss America pageant or the uh, Miss, uh, what is it, uh, so there's some that are bigger in scope than that, Universe, is that what it is? He said, maybe we ought to have Miss Maggot Meat pageant. You know, that kind of puts things in perspective. <clears throat> Jesus said unto her, Said I not unto thee, that if thou wouldest believe, thou shouldest see the glory of God? Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. And I know that thou knew that thou hearest me always, but because of the people which stand by, I said it. Here's why: that they may believe that thou hast sent me. Verse forty-three. And when he thus had spoken, he cried with a loud voice, "Lazarus, come forth!" Amen. And he that was dead came forth. Yes. Came forth. <laughs> In. <laughs> You know where I'm going with this. Was it good that Lazarus was so sick? No. And it's not unscriptural to say so. Sickness such as this is a consequence of the curse of sin. Was it good that he died as a result of the sickness with all the attendant suffering that sickness of that degree must entail? No. And for the same reason. But God worked it together for, for, for good. Which Jesus identified in verses 40 and 42 when he said that thou shouldest see the glory of God and that they may believe that thou hast sent me. At this point, <laughs> based on what we've looked at so far, you're possibly wondering how this is a Christmas message. Well, I wanted to look at scriptural illustrations to establish in our thinking the principle of Romans 8.28. Hopefully, we have accomplished that, so let's see that same principle worked out in the Christmas story. Matthew 1, 18 to 25, documents, don't turn there, I'm not turning there. Con documents and confirms the fact that Mary, though technically married to Joseph, was a virgin at the time she gave birth to Jesus, thus fulfilling the prophecy of Isaiah 7:14 and qualifying her child to be our Savior. Now let's go to Luke chapter 2, which is, I don't know, I like them both, but I think I lean toward Luke 2 for my preferred account of, of, of the nativity. Luke chapter 2, verse 1, And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. Verse 3, And all went to be taxed, every one into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth. There's where he started. That's where he had been, the city of Nazareth into Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem. Verse 5, with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, she delivered. Verse 7, and she brought forth her firstborn son. I'm going to read just a bit here and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger. I, I love this part in, you know, the Charlie Brown Christmas story? Amen. And Linus reads this. It's so sweet. <laughs> it's so simple. And laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord, sh Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. Say, I wouldn't have been, huh? 
And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. My wife had my oldest daughter learn probably this verse as, as the first verse she ever memorized when she was itty bitty. She's not very big now, but, but she was like two years old or, or less. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. It is approximately an 80 mile trip from Nazareth to Bethlehem over rocky and rough terrain. No developed roads and no motels along the way. In their circumstances, the trip could easily have taken from 10 days to two weeks' time. What thoughts might have gone through one or the other of their minds? Surely the Lord could have picked a virgin girl already living in Bethlehem to fulfill Mary's role, or, or maybe they could wait and make the trip after she had the baby. Of course, their faith and confidence that the Lord would securely finish what he had started might have preempted such thoughts. But then, too, any thought of someone else fulfilling Mary's role at that point would be vain. She was already nearly full term in her pregnancy. As for the possible idea of waiting to make the trip, the demands of the Roman government had no hardship exception clauses. No, from a human perspective, I don't think there's a person here who would call this situation good, but just as Romans 8.28 promises, God worked it for good. Just think about what God accomplished in this scenario. Though these points overlap, their significance is made clearer if we consider them somewhat separately. Number one, God is glorified. Think about this. Only He is big enough to use the IRS of the day to accomplish his purpose. His hand is clearly seen in that Mary did not go to Bethlehem on her own initiative. God took steps to see to it that she got there. He put her where she needed to be. Otherwise, her child would have been born in Nazareth. By being in Bethlehem at that time of Jesus' birth, the prophecy of his birthplace in Micah 5.2 was fulfilled, further confirming his credentials and qualification to be our Savior. And number four, despite the circumstances, Mary brought forth her firstborn son to be the Savior of the world. Of course, there is another Romans 8.28 scenario that took place about 33 years after this one. It was, in fact, the unfolding of this second scenario that gave the first one significance. Peter, in his summary of that event to Cornelius in Acts chapter 10, said in verses 38 and 39, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him, and we are witnesses of all things which he did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hanged on a tree. Were the wicked acts of the individuals who contributed to the hanging on a tree of such a one as these few words describe good? No, no. But God worked it together for good. By means of those events, God provided salvation for all who will receive it through this one who was born for the good despite negative circumstances on that first Christmas. The application seems obvious. If these and other individuals, including the Lord Jesus himself, successfully went through these trials in the past, which God worked together for good, surely we can too. Jesus said in John 15, 20, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If Jesus and God's servants of the past successfully endured such things, surely we can too 
knowing by faith that God works them together for good, whether we live to see the results or not. Some have not. I'm always, I always hesitate to bring such a message as this. The Lord impressing it on my mind may be preparing me personally for a situation in which I'll be called to live up to it. If that happens, please remind me of it, but do so compassionately and gently. I'll be sure to do the same for you. In the meantime, Merry Christmas to each of you from Beverly and me. Pastor, would you...